This begins an oral history interview with Justice Stuart Pollock on July 18th, 2017 in Morristown, New Jersey with Sean Illingworth of the Rutgers Oral History Archive for the New Jersey Supreme Court Oral History Project. And thank you very much for sitting down with me today. Happy to be here. All right. <coughs> uh, to begin, I just want to uh, comment on uh, this wonderful facility that we're doing the interview in. It's uh, kind of unique. It's within sight of your, your high school, uh, the office where you started your law career, um, and the uh, chambers where you sat for, uh, well, well, no, the, uh, the chambers that you established during your time at, as the uh, uh, Associate Supreme Court Justice, right? All true. Yes. And Thoreau said he had traveled much in Concord. I have traveled much in Morristown. <laughs> Well, why don't we uh, start there? Um, can you uh, tell us where and when you were born? I was born December 21, 1932, in East Orange, New Jersey, in my grandparents' home. And what were your parents' names? Well, my father's name was James Ford Pollock, and my mother's name was Helen Glasson Pollock. And if you know, um, on, on both sides of the family, but starting with your father's side. How did the families come to settle in this area? Well, my father's grandmother came over from Scotland and uh, originally was in Brooklyn and then came to Newark. My mother's uh, father came from England and her mother came from uh, Syracuse, New York and they lived in Rocky Hill. That's uh, down near Princeton? Yes, yes. exactly so. Uh -huh. And uh, her, my grandmother's maiden name was Robbins, and I think there's still a lot of Robbins family down there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do you know how your parents met? I think they met in church. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this this goes back into the around 1920, and I think that's how it was. Uh, what brought the family to the East Orange area? Uh, my grandfather had his own business. He he was quite an enterprising man. Uh, came over from England, traveling steerage. He founded a company, and they did uh, asbestos lining on the pipes, which at that time was state of the art and subsequently turned out to be not such a good idea. And, um, you know, having these grandparents who emigrated to the U.S., uh, did you ever hear any stories from them about what their lives had been like before coming? <laughs> well, I, re I remember hearing that my, it would have been my great-grandmother's father, my great-great-grandfather, uh, had been a maker of golf clubs and golf balls in Scotland, and before that he'd been a sailor, and apparently it was common for sailors when they got tired of the sea to start making golf balls because they were used to stitching sails, and in those days golf balls were stitched together by hand and they, uh, they were called featheries uh, because in each golf ball there would be a hat full of feathers that got soaked in water, stuffed into the leather pouch, and sewed up. Unfortunately, the manufacture of golf balls became uh, a little more modernized, <laughs> but my gr great great grandfather continued to stuff feathers into leather pouches, which I think led to the immigration to the United States. Mm. So, um, your parents uh, were were married in uh, the twenties, uh, right? And you have an older brother, older brother, and a younger sister. Okay, what are their names? Uh, Don Donald no, my, well, is my older brother, and my sister's name is Polly. Okay. And when did the family relocate to uh, Mendham? Uh, Nineteen thirty-four. I was a little over a year old. And my grandfather very kindly built a house for my parents in Brookside, New Jersey, mm. <clears throat> which in those days was just an ordinary house. 
I'm now told it's worth a million dollars, which is hard to believe. Mm. But times change. Well, and Brookside is a part of Mendham, or is it a separate? It's Brookside thing? is the eastern end of Mendham Township. Mendham okay. Township is like a horseshoe around Mendham Borough, with the eastern end being here and the western end being Ralston. Mm. Now, um, this house that was built, was it uh, kind of off by itself? Was it part of a neighborhood? I think you could safely say it was part of a neighborhood. Uh, it was right next to my uncle's house, my mother's brother, and it was two houses up from uh, the center of town, which uh, consisted of a general store. In one building, there was a post office general store and two gas pumps. There was a school, a four-room school, which had eight grades in it, two grades in a room, one teacher teaching everything to both grades. There was a community house where exotic functions like the fireman's turkey dinner and square dances occurred. And then there was one church, the Brookside Community Church, and the firehouse next to the church. That, that was it. <laughs> and uh, what did your father do for a living? He was a salesman, and he uh, sold um, pipes, uh, you know, long distance transmission pipe. For uh, like oil or um, I think the biggest I think the biggest thing they had was a gas line. Okay. Uh, but I'm not too sure about that. Whether I don't I don't think they did any oil. Mm. So would um, as a salesman would he be uh, uh, on the road often or did he work mostly in the area? Most of the time he worked uh, out of an office in New York and in I would say in the metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. uh, but every now and then he would take a trip somewhere, you know. And did your mother work outside of the home? She didn't. She was a homemaker. Um, and I think that was typical of that era. Mm -hmm. So describe for me kind of what you would do uh, growing up in the 30s in, in this kind of idyllic small town that you described. Uh, what what would you do for fun? What was your daily routine like when you were a school well, age I, child? I, of course, it changed over time. Uh, but I think every kid in town had a shotgun, uh, every boy at least. And so there was hunting, fishing. Uh, Brookside had a baseball diamond. That was our, our, our one athletic facility. Mm. I don't think there was a basketball standard in town. Uh, and uh, so I think pretty much uh, that was those were the sorts of things we did. Um, I, uh, from an early age, my parents encouraged me to work, mm -hmm. so I had a lot of different jobs starting at an early age, and uh, one of them was involved working in the Brookside store after school which was quite an experience. I mean, you, you got, got to know everything about everybody in town, mm. the good, the bad, and the ugly. Did you have to um, write out everything on, the, on a bag? Uh, I've heard that from others, people who worked in uh, general stores. No, I don't recall doing that. Okay. I mean, or add up all the uh, items. Oh, yeah, you, had, you, you did that. You, were, you figured out what people had bought, and then you would write it out on a piece of paper or a mm -hmm. bag or something, but uh, uh, it, it was quite an experience, and particularly growing up during the Depression mm -hmm. when some folks were uh, hard-pressed and the storekeeper had to carry them from one week to the next. Mm -hmm. You got to know, as I say, everything about everybody in town, who was having a hard time, who was drinking too much, all that sort of thing. Uh, but it was so it was quite a window on the world. Mm. So, uh, w talk a little bit more about the impact of the Great Depression on you know your community, but also if it had any effect on your your family. Well, uh, you know, every I think everybody was in the same boat, so you you really you really didn't uh, think too much. Uh, whether times were hard or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, th I think the, my parents had limited education, so 
They knew that education was important, and we grew up knowing two things. One, we were going to go to college, and two, we were going to pay for it ourselves. And uh, that, those were two guiding principles. Hmm. Now, uh, before uh, your generation, had anybody gone to college in your no. family? No. Okay. Where do you think that drive to have the children go to uh, college came from? I think they realized that th there were opportunities that they had missed because they didn't have an education. Mm -hmm. And, that, and without, <clears throat> without putting any overt pressure, they simply communicated to us that this was important. Mm -hmm. Now you described the first school you went to as uh, four rooms and two grades in each room? Yes. Is that right? Um, tell me about that experience. Um, you know, th that's something that you don't really see today, but how did, how did that impact your early education? Uh, hmm. Well, my, my first teacher was Janet Lang, into whose home I moved in the, in the 1990s. Hmm. Uh, and it was, you know, it was a, there were only eight kids, I think, in my class. Uh, and you got to know everybody. You got to know uh, their families. Uh, and I, 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 I admire the teachers who taught us because <laughs> they must have had their hands full mm -hmm. teaching two grades. They would work with one, one grade during, for a couple hours, then shift over to the other. And somehow it seemed to work. Uh, but I, I don't have any you know, too clear recollection. We started off every day with the Pledge of Allegiance mm -hmm. and the, the Bible reading, uh, and then moved into, into the studies. Hmm. Um, well, I, I just mentioned that because uh, a number of people I've interviewed who were in multi-grade schoolhouses say you would pick things up faster because you would hear it twice, essentially, or more times. <coughs> Uh, do you remember that at all? I don't. Okay. I don't. Uh, but it makes sense. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, you, you talked about the uh, job in the general store. Yes. Were, there, were there other jobs that you would do around town? Oh, yeah. Well, we, from an early age, I started off cutting lawns, raking leaves, shoveling snow. Uh, the, jo the, the, the job in the store is what took a took a lot of time. Mm -hmm. I would say, I don't know whether I started in the sixth or seventh grade, the sixth, seventh, or eighth grades. Mm -hmm. I, f I faced the first ethical dilemma of my life while, uh, while working in the store. One winter, uh, there had been a huge snowstorm. Power lines were down. I think in those days it was Jersey Central that provided the power. And a group, this is during World War II, when mm -hmm. you had to have ration stamps or tokens to get anything with meat. And uh, there was a crew from the power company working in town, and they came in to buy a can of baked beans that had pork in it. They were mm -hmm. going to heat it up and eat it for lunch. I was in the store alone, and the... <clears throat> They came in, they plunked down the can of beans on the counter, and I said, well, do you have any tokens? And they said they didn't. So I, I had to decide whether to give them the, the uh, pork and beans without the tokens or take a hard line and insist on the tokens. Mm. What, what did you wind up doing? Well, what would you have done? <laughs> well, uh, they were uh, hungry, I guess you would give them well, the that food. Well, that was about the so level of sophistication that I brought to the analysis. Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, I gave him the beans, but for weeks thereafter, I expected to have a, hear a knock on the door and see an FBI <laughs> agent saying, are you the kid who sold the pork and beans and didn't get the token? Mm -hmm. But, uh, and, uh, you know, th those things form, form who you are, mm -hmm. those experiences. Mm -hmm. Did um, uh, religion or church activities Shape your life yeah, they early did. On. That, they're, they're, this is before television, and the mere, nearest movie house was here in Morristown, which was six miles away. So 
church was important, uh, and it was a community church. Uh, and uh, I don't know if this is of interest to you or anyone else, but it, it does recall to mind. Uh, we sometimes at the church had a student minister who went to Drew University down the road in Madison. And w one year they had a big barrel in the middle of the store and the idea was if you bought something, buy something extra and throw it in there for a needy family. And every time Mr. Matat, who was then the minister, came in, he would put something in the barrel. And on Christmas Eve, the committee came, picked up the barrel and delivered it to him. <laughs> uh, but that was the sort of thing that, that happened. It, was, it really was a sort of Norman Rockwell existence. Mm -hmm. uh, was it uh, largely, um, you know, um, one ethnicity, or was it somewhat diverse? Or? Very little diversity. Okay. My introduction to diversity came when I left the eighth grade in Brookside Grammar School and came to Morristown High School. Mm. Well, before we get into high school, uh, I did want to go back to World War II. What what impact did, did that have on the community? I, well, I learned how to identify German and Japanese airplanes, no, none of which I ever saw in the sky. Uh, and, you know, there were the young men in service and some of the young women went into military service. Some didn't come back. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone knew about that. Uh, and there were, you know, there was the rationing, and everybody, we, everybody had a victory garden. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I can't really say we suffered. We were very much aware of, uh, obviously, of, of the fact that there was a was a war on. Mm -hmm. Everybody did his or her part. Uh, but that was pretty much it. Mm -hmm. Would you say in your family? Um, you know, current events were, were discussed often or, or the uh, other way around? I, I'm sure they were discussed, but there was not, there was not a lot of lively discussion uh, and, uh, in, within the family. I'd or things like politics, uh, you know, what did your family think of <coughs> FDR, for example? I'll tell you, the, mo the clearest relevant uh, recollection I have about the role politics might play. The economy didn't shift an awful lot mm -hmm. between the Depression and World War II. And uh, my father uh, uh, ran for tax assessor one year, and I, think, I don't know what the tax assessor made, a couple of hundred dollars. Uh, and my father was, everybody liked my father, and I, and I can understand why that would be so. One of the big events in town was the Fourth of July celebration where the volunteer firemen would march and they would have prizes for contestants and that sort of thing. Anyway, I remember coming up from the parade with my father. We walked past the store. On the right-hand side was a shed, which is still there. and. As we walked by, there were two men in the shed, and they shouted to my father, come in, and he, he went in, and I stood out on Woodland Road waiting for him. He came out, he was visibly upset, and what they had done was offer him $100 to drop out of the race, mm -hmm. and he knew that was wrong. Now, this was a man with very little education, but he had a good sense of right and wrong and a high sense of integrity. And I often remember that, that you don't, you don't need a lot of education to know what is the right thing to do. And that, that, that's a lesson worth keeping. Mm. So that, that, that was about the extent of the political discussion in our family. Wow. Did, did he stay in the race? He did, and he won. Oh, okay by not very many votes, but he won. Did he uh, get involved in other uh, public officials? My father? Roles? Yeah. yeah. Well, everybody, he was, at, he was on the board of the church. He was 
on the school board, um, which was kind of interesting because he never finished grade school, yeah. but uh, people liked and trusted him, mm. and for good reason. Was your mother involved in community activities? She, I know she was the treasurer of the church, and she was not a great joiner. Uh, there was a, something called the Ladies' Aid Society. I have no idea what they did, but she was part of it. Mm. Uh, but I, th I think she limited, limited herself, I think, to the um, activities in the church. Well, um, between work and school, did you have time for other extracurricular activities like Boy Scouts or anything like that? Well, we, we, we had a uh, Boy Scout troop that came and went from time to time, but uh, when it was there, I was part of it. Mm. Uh, we, had, we played baseball and we had, uh, uh, and then a, I would often, I, uh, one of my closest companions growing up was my dog. So mm. at the end of the day, he and I would often go off, sometimes go fishing, sometimes go hunting, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was one part of my life of which I'm not now proud, but it happened. Uh, I also had a trap line as a kid. Mm. I couldn't do it today, and I wouldn't do it today, but I did it then. And uh, so and that, that, that took a that was several miles you had to walk every day. Mm. Would you um, sell what you caught? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there was a, f a fellow over in Gladstone who buy the, bought the pelts. Mm. Yeah. I, I'm curious, uh, going back to the Depression again, um, were you aware of uh, people coming through town, uh, you know, uh, what we might call transients today, uh, looking for food or work? Or? No. Okay. Um, Brookside was pretty much a self-contained little community. The only folks who came through uh, during uh, World War II, the Army came up on a training maneuver mm. and they marched through Brookside. And I remember my mother said, here, take them some cookies. And I went out to give uh, the, these fellows some cookies, and the officer said, no, they, they're not allowed to do it. They're in training for war. And you might be the enemy. So <laughs> I took the cookies back. <laughs> um, so d jumping ahead to uh, going into Morristown High School, uh, you would have, that would have been about 1945 or so? I started in 45. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that must have been at least a somewhat large change in your life, having to travel and being exposed to new people. It was wonderful. I mean, I I was tremendously excited by it, but it, wa it was uh, it w it was the first time you got introduced to diversity and you see folks of different races, different religions, and I loved it. Mm -hmm. What uh, interested you the most in high school? Hmm. Uh, I guess there, there was one teacher who took pity on me. I was terrified of speaking in public when I w went, uh, went to high school. I knew I had to overcome it. And uh, I so I signed up for the debate club, and there was a wonderful man, uh, T.M. Cowan, who took me under his wing and uh, exposed me to debating, to public speaking, and I'll be forever, <laughs> forever grateful to him uh, because it, uh, it was something I knew I had to do, and we did it. So, um, do any of those debates stand out in your head, uh, or maybe trips <laughs> re related to the debate team? Well, the first not so much the actual debates, but well, the experiences. The, 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 the first time, the first time I got exposed to a debate, I had he said, "Look, go go watch and see how it's done." And the unfortunate part was the debate was on a subject uh, on which I had never heard: euthanasia. So I, not never having heard of euthanasia, 
I thought they were talking about young people in the Far East, mm -hmm. and they were all dying. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't until about halfway through the debate I realized it was something else. Mm -hmm. That gives you some idea of the level of sophistication that I brought to the process. Mm -hmm. So um, describe the high school a little bit, um, what, it was, what it was like. It must have been quite different from the two grades oh, in yeah, one, oh, one yeah. schoolroom. You had a, you, we had a home room to which we re-reported uh, re every day. Uh, and then you went from room to room for your classes. Uh, and there was always lots of, you know, pushing and shoving and shouting and all, all the good things that teenagers do, mm -hmm. uh, which is quite different from going to one room for two years and sitting in a desk. You know, I'm, I'm also curious, uh, I know in those years after World War II, there were a lot of veterans who went back to high school. Um, were you aware of if they had a presence at the high school at all? They were, by the, I graduated from Morristown High School in 1950, and I, there, were, there was an occasional veteran who came back, but there were very, very few. Okay. Very, very few. Hmm. So, you know, with the travel and your work and all, were, again, were you able to get involved in any extracurricular activities other than the debate club? Uh, I did. Um, I, I played on a state championship tennis team, um, and uh, in, my, in my senior year, I had done enough so my classmates picked me as most likely to succeed, which was I don't, I don't know what they based their judgment, but that's the way it turned out. I had done other things. I'd been the editor of the paper. I can't, th uh, I, I also, again, I worked after school. Uh, so that, that somewhat limited what I could do, mm. but I didn't. Uh, were, were you still at the store? No, uh, I worked at a lot of places here in Morristown. Um, one place was, well, it's now Century 21, mm -hmm. and it was Bamberger's in those days. Uh, then uh, there were, used to be stores out along here on Speedwell Avenue. I worked in, in a couple of those. There were stores on South Street uh, where I worked in a couple of those. Uh, so, I, oh, and then in the evenings I worked in the YMCA, uh, where the YMCA is no longer in town. Mm. But so I kept busy. Mm. Wow. So um, you spent a lot of time here in Morristown as a, a youth. Yeah, I did. And the, I, I would hitchhike back and forth. And, and the kids did that in those days. They don't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. But uh, you would hitchhike back and forth to Morristown. So any experiences from, from working at that early age that stand out? Uh, were, were you working as a salesman or a, a stock boy? Or? Whatever, ha you, you got it. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, all of that and more. Started out as a stock boy. Uh, and then in my senior year of high school, I worked, uh, I worked parking cars at Bamberger's. Mm -hmm. By that time, I had a driver's license. And then I worked inside the store over Christmas, the Christmas holidays. Uh, the, the, I'm, uh, for some reason I'm recalling, there used to be a dog show in Madison <clears throat> on what it was called in those days the Dodge Estate. <clears throat> it was where Mrs. Hartley Dodge lived. And, uh, and it's now called Geralda Farms, which is what the name she, uh, uh, the name she gave it. Anyway, the, it was the largest dog show on earth, mm. and you could you used to see it. if you went to the movie theaters there would be newsreels that would include Mrs. Dodge's dog show, and the uh, uh, it had one of the descriptors they used for it was that it had more canvas in it than the Barnum and Bailey Circus. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I went down one day, one year and worked at that, and I my I had the weighty responsibility of helping the handlers get the chow chows into the ring. 
And at the end of the day, <clears throat> the, uh, I remember the judge who was from Kentucky came up and said, here, young man, and he gave me a $5 tip. <laughs> that, that, that was pretty fancy pay for, yeah. a, for a day's work. Uh, but that, that was just one of the things you did. Right. So um, before uh, you went off to college, uh, had you really had any opportunity to travel much beyond the Mendham Morristown area? Only to, the, to this extent, and I'll, I'll, there's a man to whom I'll be forever grateful. Dr. Perry was the principal of the Morristown High School. And he and two other men had a summer camp in Vermont. And during World War II, the, uh, the young men who would ordinarily be counselors there, the college students, were in service. Hmm. Uh, so th my brother, who preceded me, was... Uh, account was asked to be a counselor, and uh, I ended up going up, uh, so initially starting out as a waiter. No, I started out doing odd jobs up there, and uh, be, <laughs> got promoted to being a waiter, and then to being a counselor. But th that summer camp experience was a tremendous, it was great, because it introduced me to a world not only outside Brookside, but outside New Jersey. There were, there were students there, or campers, I should say, uh, who were from all different parts of the country, went to private schools. Uh, and this was a phenomenon to which I hadn't previously been exposed. And that was where I learned how to play tennis. Hmm. Uh, and I, re I really got hooked on it. Uh, I, up until then, baseball had been the big sport in my life, but I, it didn't take long for me to realize in tennis you were always at bat and you never had to go to the, out in the field. <laughs> um, so you graduated from Morristown in 54? In 50. 50. Oh, oh yeah, I'm sorry, 50. Um, and you went off to college at Hamilton. Yes. Um, how, how did uh, Hamilton come on your radar? Oh, well, it goes back to this summer camp. Um, the religious advisor, whatever you called him, that was a, who was a counselor, uh, had gone to Hamilton. As I say, my brother was, a, was two and a half years older than I, and uh, Don had pretty much decided he wanted to be a doctor. And Hamilton had then, as I trust it has now, a uh, superb pre-med program. And so uh, my brother went there. When it came my turn, I was determined to go anywhere but where he was. And uh, again, finances w was relevant. I remember uh, on the same uh, ag venture, I went to Amherst. And I remember telling the admissions counselor, that uh, admissions officer, that I would need financial aid. And he said, oh, that's difficult. Ultimately, they did offer me a very nice scholarship. But when I went to Hamilton, I met the dean of admissions uh, and told him, I said, look, I'm going to need a scholarship. And his response was, oh, Stu, we can take care of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I felt like I'd found a place where I belonged, mm. and so that was that, that was the the big choice, the the big reason for going there. Mm. At that point, did you have any ideas in mind of what you might do in your life? No, I I I, I really didn't. I really didn't know, and uh, unfortunately, that, that was a condition that that obtained down to my senior year, mm. and uh, I Hamilton had an honor system. And I had been on the honor court all four years. I was chairman my fourth year. And it was, uh, we dealt with academic issues only, academic discipline. We had a couple of very hard cases in my senior year. And I remember walking past the administration building uh, one day, and the dean was walking out. And he said, Stu, what are you going to do next year? And I said, I'm not sure. And he said, well, I think you ought to go to law school. And uh, uh, so I started looking into that. 
and there was a uh, by this I had I had had a lot of jobs in college also, uh, some of them unusual, and uh, I I knew finances were going to be important, and NYU had a very generous scholarship plan which paid room, board, and tuition, and uh, I applied, went into the contest for it. Was lucky enough to get one of the scholarships. And that's where I went to law school. Hmm. Well, um, uh, when you were at Hamilton, what uh, course of study did you take? I, philo I'm, I was a philosophy major, and I, I, I thought there really were answers to the big questions in life. By the time I left, I realized there weren't. Hmm. But at least I learned something about uh, how to analyze issues and so forth. Uh, any professors stand out in your memory or courses? Yes. Uh, the, the two of the best prof teachers I ever had in my life. Ha in those days, Hamilton had <coughs> a program. Uh, it was called the Freshman Seminar. In those days, classes met six days a week. And there, the Freshman Seminar met six days a week. Uh, everybody had to take a required English course for three years, but if you qualified for this seminar, it was six days, and I, I would, fortunately I, I qualified for it. And there were only, I think there were only like 10 or 12 students in the class. And uh, we had two professors, two superb gifted teachers with very different styles. Uh, Tom Johnston was the first semester uh, teacher, professor. And then the second semester, we had George Nesbitt, who was the head of the department. And the, these were terrific men and terrific professors.